Good morning. Just waiting for our attendees to join us. Welcome to Macquarie University's event for History Week 2020. These events are a little bit different this year and we're just sort of finding our feet at the moment. This is our first Zoom webinar, so bear with us if we have some dramas. I'm just watching the attendees come in to our virtual room. I hope you're all well and doing lots of fun History Week activities so far and we'll be doing many more across the week to come. Macquarie University has been associated with the History Council of New South Wales for over 25 years since the History Council was established and we are really proud of our continued association and joint efforts imparting the value and significance of history to New South Wales as residents and to others far and wide. I want to begin our proceedings today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of Macquarie University land from which we are presenting today the Watamatical clan of the Darug Nation, whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture this land since a dream time. I would also like to pay our respects to elders past, present and future of the Darug Nation and extend that respect to other indigenous guests present with us today. As many of you are participating in this webinar remotely from various locations, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and elsewhere for that matter, and their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We have a really exciting lineup for you today, showcasing the wonderful research, teaching and community engagement that our departments of uh, modern history and ancient history and archaeology uh, can show to you today. And our wonderful um, uh, series of talks will start with um, David Christian and our, our schedule has changed slightly. So David will speak first, followed by Claire Monagall, Michelle Arrow, Gil Davis, Susan Lupak and then Gillian Smith. Uh, we will then have a short break, just 10 minutes, while we reconvene uh, for questions at 10.20. And you can start asking your questions while speakers are presenting their talks and we will gather them up. And while we only have half an hour for questions after the speakers have presented their work, uh, we will endeavour to answer all of them. And if we can't do so as part of this Zoom webinar, then we look forward to answering them after the event and we'll email you to follow up. So first off, I am delighted uh, to introduce our distinguished professor, David Christian, who um, is world renowned for his work on Russian history and as the founder of Big History, written many wonderful books. And today he's going to be talking to us about history as origin story. Um, and I look forward to hearing what he has to say. And it's especially exciting that David is joining us here today for this event because he'll be retiring at the end of this year and he's just been a magnificent member of the department here at Macquarie. Thank you. David. Welcome, David. You're off. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm David Christian and I've taught Russian history, world history and also what's known as big history at Macquarie for many, many years. So what is history good for? Many things, of course, but here I want to make an argument that's really at the level of world history. One thing history is definitely good for is creating a strong sense of community and of loyalty to community. The value of history statement of the History Council of New South Wales uh, captures this very well. History, it says, shapes our identities, and I'm reading from this document, shapes our identities, engages us as citizens, creates inclusive communities. Now, I, I want to zero in on the idea that history creates inclusive communities. What that really means, of course, is that it creates a sense of community that includes some people and inevitably excludes others. History can definitely do this. 
Just think of the power of all the great national histories, from Macaulay to Manning Clark, and why not add the Roman historian Livy or the Han Chinese historian Sima Qian? No wonder all governments insist that national histories are a central part of school curricula. Now, this power to hold communities together, to build loyalties, makes history very, very powerful. In his wonderful book on nationalism, Imagined Communities, Benedict Anderson shows how historians, archivists, museum builders, and other scholars and intellectuals have built extraordinarily powerful national identities and a sense of loyalty that bound citizens to nations. And they did this by telling engaging, rich, vivid, and absorbing stories about the birth and evolution of the communities of which we're members. When did my nation, religion, civilization first appear? What has it achieved? How has it suffered? What epic events has my community lived through? Such stories can create a sense of belonging that is as visceral and emotionally gripping as our sense of family. So powerful are these stories that people will lay their lives down for the imagined communities they describe even though they will never meet most members of those communities. So in this way, over several centuries, the history profession has helped draw the fault lines that have shaped human loyalties and human conflicts across the entire globe. That's very powerful. Now, if history really is this powerful, then clearly it matters what communities histories choose to create and describe in their work. In recent centuries, many historians have devoted their lives particularly to the histories of nations. Now, not surprisingly, national governments have given massive financial and political and institutional support to this project. They funded the writing and teaching of national histories and built them into national syllabi. So today, the idea of a national community still shapes a vast amount of historical research and teaching. Just look at the titles of university or school courses and you'll find that many are about nations. I myself teach courses in Russian history. I teach about a national or imperial community. Now in a world organized into almost 200 nation states, telling these stories makes a lot of sense. But, and here's the but, as the world becomes more interconnected, I think the teaching of national histories is also becoming frankly dangerous. This is because the sense of community can exclude as well as include. In a world with nuclear weapons, I often wonder if it is really smart to keep building a sense of community around the idea of distinct national tribes. And in fact, a larger and even more significant community is emerging and it's emerging very, very fast. And this story needs to be told. That is the community of all human beings. Because today, we are interconnected and interdependent as never before. Today's most profound challenges can no longer be tackled nation by nation. In a world that's been turned upside down in a few months by the discovery of a new virus, collaboration, cooperation, and a sense of loyalty now has to extend beyond the national, religious, and civilizational borders that shape traditional loyalties. 50 years ago, a German historian, Gerhard Hirschfeld, already saw this clearly. Now he wrote, almost suddenly, mankind has become an intercommunicating and interdependent whole in which every part is vulnerable to destruction by other parts. For the first time, our planet is living a single history. Sadly, this is a community that historians rarely discuss. Where are the courses on the history of humanity? Those courses will have to include the whole world and they will have to reach back two or three hundred thousand years. Now, teaching the history of humanity is not at all impossible. It's perfectly doable. At Macquarie University, we've been doing this for over 30 years within big history courses. And similar courses are being taught within a small number of universities and schools. But they are rare. So, here's the challenge to historians. Can historians generate a sense of shared purposes and loyalties to the community of all humans? Can they tell the diverse, conflict-ridden story of humanity? And can they do that with the colossal narrative and emotional power of the great national histories? 
Can they also do this with the rigor of the best modern historical research? And can the telling of these global histories help build the sense of a single global community that contains all the different national communities, but can encourage the sort of global collaboration that we will need if we were to cope with the vast challenges of the near future? And those challenges really are vast and they are global. As a species, we are now so powerful that the challenge we now face is that of managing an entire biosphere. Suddenly, we have such power that what we humans do over the next few decades will make or break the biosphere and determine the fate of millions of other species for millions of years. We have weapons that could destroy much of the world in 24 hours. We also have technologies that could stabilize and help the biosphere and future generations of humans to flourish for many centuries or millennia. Historians have a crucial role to play here because we're unlikely to meet this challenge unless historians can help us create a sense of loyalty to a larger human community by telling the origin story of all of humanity over hundreds of thousands of years. Now, I'd like to end by quoting the words of a great world historian, Bill McNeil, W.H. McNeil. This is what he said in an address to the American Historical Association more than 30 years ago. Humanity entire possesses a commonality which historians may hope to understand just as firmly as they can comprehend what unites any lesser group. Instead of enhancing conflicts, as parochial historiography inevitably does, an intelligible world history might be expected to diminish the lethality of group, group encounters by cultivating a sense of individual identification with the triumphs and the tribulations of humanity as a whole. This indeed, he concludes, strikes me as the moral duty of the historical profession in our time. We need to develop an ecumenical history with plenty of room for human diversity in all of its complexity. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Just before we uh, move on to our second speaker, I'm sure you will have lots of questions for David, and I encourage you to use the Q&A function on Zoom in order to do that. I'm going to make sure that we're COVID safe. I'm going to have a quick wipe down of the table before the wonderful Associate Professor Claire Monagall joins us. And uh, Claire is head, uh, is chair of the discipline of modern history in our new um, history and archaeology department. Claire has been at Macquarie now for how many years? Five. For five years. Um, she teaches uh, medieval history and the history of gender and, and feminist history here at Macquarie. And she will be talking to us today about her work. Thank you, Claire. Hi everybody, and even though I can't see a number of you who are out there, I'd just like to say thank you so much for joining us because it is really gratifying to us that you are here to listen and we're looking forward to hearing your questions. I'm really delighted to follow David Christian because as David just explained, he's done a tremendous amount of work in articulating and explaining and producing new visions of history that are planetary, universal, and cover this enormous scope of human time, or not just human time, sorry, pre-human time as well. Um, but, and the reason I'm happy to follow David is that I recently had a conversation with my son that really helped me think about what I wanted to say today. My son is nine years old and he's just beginning to understand precisely some of the things that David talks about, about the extraordinary scale of the universe, about experiences and understandings of time that far transcend our experiences of human time and our sense of the boundaries that we experience as human people. And so my little boy was saying that how it's sort of good and exciting to understand that we are just, you know, tiny little pieces of matter that won't last for long. And he said to me that he finds that good and exciting to think about how small we are as humans. But then he said, but if we are so small, why is it so hard to be alive? It's not fair that life is so hard, given that we don't really matter. And that comment that he made, which really sort of st stuck me in the heart, made me think about that is the ch one of the challenges of being human, 
is to make meaning out of what feels like often a pretty random existence. And as a historian, I've always worked on and I continue to be fascinated by how do we make meaning out of what feels like our contingent and our inexplicable human existences? We feel so many things, our lives are so very hard so much of the time, we're often so very confused. And yet, when we think in the big kinds of scale that David has explained and explains them so beautifully, it also feels like, oh, we're just, we're just so little. So how do we think about and how do we understand as historians, how have humans dealt with that problem of meaning? How do we make meaning out of lives that often experience, where we experience injustice, where we experience pain, where we experience joy? And even though throughout human history and across the globe right now, human experience is incredibly diverse, there are the universals of joy and sadness, of birth and death. And so as a historian, what is it good for? Well. We can't answer these questions of meaning. It'd be great if we could, but frankly, um, no, nobody's been able to so far. We can't answer these questions of deep meaning, but what we can do as historians and what I get a huge amount of pleasure from when I, when I talk to students and when I do my own research, I get a huge amount of pleasure and consolation and my own sense of meaning in thinking about how communities and how individuals have over time in various locations used the resources that they have to hand and that might be the natural world, that might be a set of sacred texts, it could be commodities, it could be the particularities of their geographical situation. People have used the data around them, the resources around them to construct systems and rituals of meaning that attempt, if not to solve the problem of why are we here or, and, why, and why do we hurt, if not to solve those problems, if to attempt to put a shape around those problems and to carve out borders and boundaries that enable them to live with the challenges of being human. So it's really striking to think about what history can do. David has told us how history can be so big and so expansive and can even consider as humans the history of what came before us and think about the future of what may well come after us but also as historians, we can go very, very granular and we can go right down into small moments where people grappled with the struggles and the challenges of what it is to be human and attempted to make meaning out of that. In my work and in my research, I focus particularly on medieval Europe and in particularly on medieval Christianity. And the reason I did that was when I was growing up, I was brought up in a Catholic family and I was brought up in a Catholic family in which so many of uh, aspects of the life of the church really produced our lives as a family around going to church, around um, celebrating re religious um, festivals. And this is not to say that it was an uncritical environment where there wasn't a lot of questioning, but it is to say that the, um, the temporal life of my family was really pivoted, and, and by that I should say, I mean, the way we experienced time was really based around um, the sort of the, you know, Christmas, Easter, those, those Christian events. But at the same time, I grew up in a highly secular world of um, 1980s Australia. Um, I grew up in the world of capitalism. I grew up in a world of um, post-enlightenment democracy. And so I grew up with a number of competing systems of meaning in hearing in my body and in the world that I lived in. And they couldn't be reconciled. The truths that were being taught to me about science and about the nature of the world, about, the, about politics, about secularism, those truths that were being taught to me completely in many ways contradicted the other truths that I was being exposed to as somebody who was growing up in a religious environment. And so as a historian, I really wanted to understand and go back to the origins of a great many of the things in the Catholic Church that to some degree governed my childhood existence. And because um, those ideas felt so powerful in my life and yet so contradictory to the world of sort of secular capitalism in which I was also growing up, 
I wanted to understand the moments of historical making of, of those kinds of religious structures. And so um, in, in a lot of my career, I've studied religious and intellectual culture in the Middle Ages. And I haven't done so to go in and say, look how wrong you guys were, Newton came and sorted you out. <laughs> That's not my point. My point in going and studying those communities, and this is what history enables us to do, is with a critical eye, but also a compassionate eye, looking back at this period and think, well, what resources did medieval Christians have to understand their world? How did they build a system of ritual and belief and practice? How did they build a system of, um, of structure that enabled them to make sense of those deep human questions about birth and death, about redemption, about sadness. And so what is history good for? Well, it's very good for all of the things that David um, has described, that really big stuff. But I think um, also history is really good for helping us understand that we can't solve the problems of what it is to be human. That's beyond anybody. We've been trying forever and we haven't solved it. We can't solve that problem, but we can use history to look at the myriad of people and cultures throughout history who have attempted to solve it or at least manage it with their own systems and beliefs. And even though um, we think often now, we think they got it wrong, of course we do, the benefit of hindsight. If we can also be compassionate, I think we can feel a lot of fellow feeling with our historical predecessors to understand that however different their lives were, they too grappled with meaning. And meaning changes over time, but the search for meaning is to some degree universal and history enables us to look at both the universality of the search for meaning, but also to look, about, look at how that changes over time and how the way we think things mean or the way we feel things mean is so dependent on the culture and the history that we bring to any situation. So thank you, it's been lovely to talk to you and I'd like to thank Tanya for giving me the opportunity um, and have a great history week. Thank you so much, Claire. And I'm sure there will be questions for you in our q and session as well. Thank you. And I'm going to have another wipe down before I introduce our next speaker, who is, again, the wonderful Professor uh, Michelle Arrow, who is the author of three books. Um, the last one, the prize winning, the Ernest Scott Prize winning the 70s. Um, and Michelle teaches Australian history, the history of popular culture and public history here at Macquarie University. And she's going to be talking to us about complicated histories, um, writing the history of the women's liberation movement in Australia. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. That's excellent wipe down service that has been provided here. Now I'm just going to open my, no, that's not my notes. I'm sorry, do you know where? Be. Sorry about this, guys. It won't be a moment. <laughs> mm. Okay, I can just do them with some. Um, I'll do it newsreader style with this with the. Uh, the paper on the screen, that's all good. Thank you very much to Tanya for inviting me to be a part of this event. Um, and it's kind of an exciting day for us in the history department because as after many years of existing as separate departments in the university, this is probably one of the very first occasions to bring ancient history and modern history together as we begin our new departmental life as the Department of History and Archaeology. Now, this new department has expertise on a very wide time scale, but I am at the very near, the very contemporary end of the historical span that we investigate as a collective. My latest book, The 70s, released last year, is a feminist history of that tumultuous decade in Australia, the 1970s, not the 1870s or the 1670s, the 1970s. So in my talk today, I want to argue that history is good for helping us understand the present. Um, but we have to be very careful, I think, about the ways that we shape our histories because they can mislead us about the meaning of the present moment and how we got to this present moment. 
Um, what I wanted to do in my book, I'm going to talk a little bit about the book itself, um, was to tell the history of the 1970s through the lens of gender and sexuality. Many histories of this period have focused on Whitlam and the dismissal and with good reason because we all remember that story very well. And I don't overlook those events. But my question was, how might the history of this decade look if rather than putting the political drama front and centre at the decade, if we put the changes in gender and sexuality centre at, at that uh, historical story. Now, the book's subtitle is The Personal, the Political and the Making of Modern Australia. And that might be familiar to you from the women's movement slogan, the personal is political. What I wanted to do with this book is to investigate if the personal is political, as the movement, women's movement contended that it was, then how did Australian politics change in the face of that challenge? Now, as you might expect, the history of the women's movement in Australia is obviously a very important part of that history. Now, Australia had a very distinctive response to the feminist challenge. In 1972, as the women's movement was gaining momentum worldwide as well as in Australia, so too was another political challenger, Gough Whitlam and his Labor Party, who in December 1972 would become the first Labor government elected to power in a generation in Australia. So it was a moment of huge political change. Now, in keeping with Whitlam's desire to appeal to a broader base of ALP supporters, he was relatively quick to respond to the demands of the women's movement. He appointed a women's affairs advisor named Elizabeth Reid. He quickly implemented a set of feminist policies and he tried to open up government to women's distinctive demands. He funded uh, women's refuges and health centres and he expanded the provision of childcare. Not completely successfully in all cases, but it was a kind of new recognition of women's distinctive political demands. Whitlam even established a Royal Commission on Human Relationships to find out how intimate and family life had changed in Australia and what sort of reforms the government might implement to better support families and to better support women in particular. But if you wanna know about that, you have to read my book. I'm not gonna talk about that here. Um, feminists worked with government to secure new rights and protections for women. And while we might have expected that some of those um, initiatives would have fallen away under a conservative government when the Liberal government was elected in the end of 1975, many of them were in fact actually maintained under the Fraser government. So this is not a straightforward left and right political story in the way that we might sort of assume. Now that story, I think, is pretty well known, the story of the history of the women's movement in Australia. It's the focus of much of the historiography of the feminist movement in this country. And it is often told, I think, as a distinctively Australian success story. This fandango with the state produced innovative new outcomes for women. But when I kept digging into this history of the late 1970s, so the period that we sort of, that came after that fandango with the state in the early 70s, it's clear that feminist gains were increasingly challenged, not just by the emerging orthodoxy of small government, which wanted to reduce the spending of government on these initiatives, but by anti-feminist women's groups. Now these groups and the two most successful ones or the most prominent ones were the Women's Action Alliance on the one hand, and in 1979, Women Who Want To Be Women were very small, but they were quite politically effective even if only for a very brief time. They were very good at gaining access to politicians and the media lapped it up, loved giving them more attention. They were often quoted in the press. But historians of feminism in Australia have typically overlooked them. If they've written about them at all, they're generally portrayed as weird, bizarre, sideshows to the main game of, of politics in Australia. Now, this is a very different depiction to the one that conservative women's groups get in the United States and in Great Britain, where conservative women's activism has a large and growing historiography. And perhaps this is because Australian, uh, sorry, US and British politics took a more conservative turn in the 1980s. Whereas in Australia, the long period of Labor government in the 1980s and 1990s encouraged scholars to write the history of the women's movement as a story of progress. And of course, many of those historians were intimately part of those feminist movements that they were then writing the histories of. But I would 
argue that history is good for reminding us about the strangeness of the past and the possibilities of other outcomes. And on that case, I think it's really important that historians of feminism examine the history of anti-feminism. Taking anti-feminist activism seriously is really important to understanding the ways in which women's liberation was able to make change happen in Australia and the reasons that it fell short of its goals. Now, writing the history of anti-feminism does three important things. First, it gives a more comprehensive picture of the political landscape in which the women's movement's gains were being challenged in the late 1970s. Second, because they managed to gain some political influence, it's important to recognise their success and to explain it historically. And third, if we look at the ways that anti-feminist women argued for their uh, demands, it's clear that they were borrowing in some cases from feminist language and feminist strategies, and they had some things in common with feminists. Anti-feminist women argued that the personal was political for them too, because they were arguing for the rights of mothers to stay at home. They argued that their roles as wives and mothers were not represented by the feminists who worked in government. And they also argued that women's care and housework was now neither counted nor valued by government. In 1982, representatives of women who want to be women delivered a cake iced in pink with a note on it reading from the women in the home to the men in the house to the Fraser cabinet as they were devising the federal budget. They delivered it to Parliament House. The spokeswoman Babette Francis declared that the cake was, quote, symbolic of the work of homemakers, which is not included in the estimates of gross domestic product. Now, in this language, she's almost making a claim that feminists made themselves. She's making a very good point. And it is a possible source of common ground, I think, between anti-feminist women and women in the women's movement that wasn't picked up at the time. And of course, the problem of valuing women's work was not solved in the 1970s or 80s. Women's unpaid care work remains underpaid uh, and undervalued and devalued, in fact. A fact amply demonstrated in the uneven impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and the government's response to it. A progressive history of the women's movement then can't explain our current situation. Anti-feminist women are part of that story and we need to put them back into it. So I think to finish up, we need a history of the women's movement that traces the histories of its supporters, but also its opponents. This is the kind of history that can help us understand the ways in which women's social, political and cultural roles have changed, but also why so many aspects of their lives have proven resistant to that change. Thank you, I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Michelle. Right. Thank you so much for this weird world. <laughs> <laughs> this is most untoward, this uh, up and down and constant wiping, but I shall make sure that it's like you get for Gil. Thank you, Michelle. And um, I need to also remind you that um, all of our talks have been recorded, this entire session has been recorded. Um, and if you can't attend for all of it, don't worry, you will be emailed a recording after the event. Um, and all of the speakers look forward to your questions coming forth. Thank you. And next up we have Dr. Gil Davis. Let me just... Uh, Okay, uh, Gil um, is, is the director of the program for ancient Mediter Mediterranean studies here at Macquarie, and he lectures in Greek history. He is going to be talking to us about the surprising origins of money. Thank you so much, Gil, for joining us. Thank you, Tanya. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm delighted to be here speaking with you about my favourite research topic, which is money. My name, as you've just heard from Tanya, is Gil Davis, and I teach Greek history. But for many years, my specialty has been archaeometallurgy, which is a fancy way to describe analyze, trying to analyse where silver came from in the ancient world, because silver was the main metal from which coins were made. I've had some very exciting experiences travelling around the world to ancient sites, and above all, to museums and laboratories, working with colleagues in many different countries, chemically, isotopically, analyzing coins in their collections. So far, we've been successful in geolocating and isotopically identifying many major ancient silver sources, mines in other words. And again, with colleagues, I've been using this information to rewrite quite a bit of history because money makes the world go round, a phrase we can attribute to Aristotle, by the way. But today, I want to speak with you about one small aspect 
and that is the origins of money. Strange to say, the origins of money are uncertain. Nowadays, it's hard to imagine a world without money, but once upon a time, small communities to great empires used barter. Let me set up the slides. And sometimes this became very sophisticated. We have records from the Neo-Babylonian Empire, for instance, in the late seventh to sixth centuries BC. This was the empire whose great king, Nebuchadnezzar II, destroyed Jerusalem in 587 BC and led the Jews off into captivity in Babylon. This empire had a fully fledged commodities exchange with daily published exchange rates for things like wheat, barley, figs, dates, and precious metals. It was so sophisticated that when money was invented, it didn't catch on in the Near East. I guess it was seen as a retrograde step at the big end of town. At the lower end, however, things were not so simple. We have a terrific example in the Bible, Genesis 23 verses 1 to 20, when Abraham the patriarch bought a plot of land from Ephron the Hittite to bury his late wife, Sarah. This was the cave of Machpelah in Hebron. For the trivia buffs, it was the first burial and also the first recorded commercial transaction in the Bible. Now Abraham, as I expect you know, was a nomad and his wealth was in flocks, silver and gold, as again the Bible tells us at Genesis 13.2. In his negotiations with Ephron, the local real estate tycoon, who seemed to have a number of bargains available, he asked for a field for, and I quote, as much silver as it was worth. After some negotiations, he weighed 400 shekels of silver, I quote again, current money with the merchant. This innocent passage opens a can of worms. He weighed the silver because the silver was in the form of bullion. A shekel was a weight, even though it later became a coinage denomination, pointing to the connection between weighing and money. The silver filled some functions of money, being acceptable, portable, and durable, but it wasn't homogenous, readily divisible, and fungible, that characteristic of money, meaning every bit of currency of the same denomination is able to be exchanged. One dollar coin is exactly the same as another, or more problematically, guaranteed as to its value. Just how pure was it? 50%, 75%, 100% silver? You can't tell just by looking. This presumably was the function of the merchant who must have acted as some sort of honest broker. Skip forward a few hundred years and our literary sources, especially Herodotus in his histories, 1.94, tells us that it was the Lydians with their empire in Northwest Turkey who were the first to invent money. And we can date that invention archeologically to the end of the seventh century, so around 625 to 600 BC. We can see precursors. Merchants started stamping bits of metal, presumably to guarantee it, with cute messages, such as the one you can see here on the screen. I'm a badge of Farnes, Farnes in the Sema retrograde. The Lydians used electrum, a combination of gold and silver but this made the problem even more acute. Gold was roughly 10 times more valuable than silver, so even a small change in percentages could lead to a big change in value. Ancient sources also told us that the Pactolus River, which flowed right through Sardis, the Lydian's capital, had natively occurring electrum in nice coin-sized nuggets. Thus the prevailing theory has been for 200 years that the Lydian kings kindly, altruistically stamped these nuggets and guaranteed their value in their domains. In other words, the coins could be redeemed at their guaranteed value from the states. From the states, sorry. The Greeks got hold of this innovation and money spread like wildfire. And that's what's in all the textbooks and articles about the invention of money. But, you knew there'd be a but. A couple of years ago, some geologists conducted an extensive survey of the Pactolus River and found no electrum, just placer deposits of gold dust, as you might expect in a river. So what really happened? In fact, it is now clear that electrum was never naturally found in nuggets. It was made from scratch. Tests on the composition prove that it was made to a controlled formula that couldn't have been natural. 55% gold, 
45% silver, and a smidgen of copper so it looks more golden, and hey presto, you have artificial electrum. Therefore, the cynical among you will be astonished to learn the motivation for inventing money and requiring that it be used in all the king's domains was none other than profit for the government. This is because the weight of coins is about 5% less than their bullion value. That 5% was profit to the crown, seniorage is a technical term, and later to all governments who issued coins. A very handy innovation indeed, but one that reminds us that profit is one of the big drivers of innovation two and a half thousand years ago and today, and it would never have been worked out without the combined contributions of geologists, analysts, and of course, historians. That's a face of history today. It's not static. Exciting new discoveries are being made all the time. I hope you want to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Gil. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to have another quick wipe down and uh, welcome Dr. Susan uh, Lupak into the room, who uh, lectures in Greek and Roman archaeology here at Macquarie. And Susan will be talking to us about her passion for archaeology and what it tells us about the past and the present. Thank you very much, Susan. Hi everyone, we're just going to get my slides set up before we start. Make sure you can see it all properly. That'll be good. Presenter mode, where is that? And I think it's down. Slideshow, oops, I can start. Okay, as long as I can make sure you guys see the right thing. Okay. Sorry? I'm just the arrow to progress. Okay. Okay. Hi there. I'm an archaeologist. I've been working in Greece on projects for the past 25 years of my life. I'm also an ancient historian. I see archaeology as a tool that can be used for doing history, for exploring the past, and for better understanding it. Archaeology is a really direct tool, as it puts you into contact with the people of the past in a very physical way. As you unearth and hold objects that were held by another person's hands thousands of years ago, and every object has a story to tell. History is learning how to read those stories. Every object on this image will tell you things about the people who used them, from the humble cooking pot on its stove, to the funny terracotta woman with the incredibly long neck holding a jug like a baby, and the lyre player, whom we can imagine was singing a story to his audience. Maybe the legend shown on the lower left of a lion battling warriors, one of whom is not going to come out alive. These objects give us clues not only about how people led their daily lives, which is important, but also they give us a window onto what those people cared about what they valued, and what they believed in. I think it must be clear already that I find these things fascinating in themselves, and it's fun to do. But I also think it is important for us to connect with the people of our past, because knowing how they live their lives can inform and guide us in how we choose to live today. So what am I working on now? I recently started a new archaeological project with my Greek colleague, Panayota Kassimi, the E4 of the region in Greece called the Corinthia. We held our first season, luckily enough, in January 2020. Our work is focused around the sanctuary of Hera at Perichora. You can see the remains of the 6th century temple in the background there, behind the happy Macquarie students having their lunch on the pier. The sanctuary is situated on the Parahora Peninsula, right where the star has just landed, opposite the city of Corinth. 
This sanctuary was of great importance to the Corinthians, and the two are closely tied in myth. It is at this sanctuary that Medea says she will bury her murdered children before she flies off to Athens in her chariot. The Haran is one of the earliest Greek sanctuaries, founded in the 9th century BC and possibly earlier. Its first cult building dates to the 8th century BC and probably looked a lot like the terracotta model that you see on the right. Four of these models were found with votive objects dedicated to the goddess Hera. Perhaps they were dedicated by women, asking Hera to smile upon their own mortal households. As Hera was the mother and wife in charge of the household of the gods, that was her domain. The Haram was also one of the wealthiest sanctuaries of its time, with dedications of gold jewelry, ivory plaques, and over 200 bronze fiali, examples of which you see here. They're a special kind of bowl used to pour offerings like wine or oil. The sanctuary was first excavated in the 1930s by British archeologist Humphrey Payne, and then again in the 1960s by another Brit, Richard Tomlinson. They revealed all of the buildings that you see on the plan, and they also started working on the town that's located in the upper plain above the sanctuary. This area has many features that you would expect in a town, lots of houses, one of which stood out for its large size called Building A1, a small temple, and a road running through it. But there are also several features that are quite distinctive. An extensive waterworks system was built to supply the water needed for the festivals held in the sanctuary, including a fountain house with vast storage basins, three 50 meter deep shafts that function as cisterns, and a 160 step staircase that connected with those shafts. Some of these features are substantial enough that they're visible on Google Earth. This town has a lot to tell us, not only about how these people worship their deities, but also about ancient technology. But very few people know about this place, and we set out to change that. We are documenting the ancient community in two ways. The first is with intensive surface survey. With this method, teams of four or five walk across the landscape, counting the number of artifacts that they see and collecting the ones that can give us a date. When we plot those shirts and their densities onto a map, we can see the relative concentrations of people's habitation over time. We're also conducting what is called legacy data verification, which means that we set out to find those walls and structures that were on Tomlinson's map. Some of them were relatively easy to find, like building A1, but others were not so easy to find. <laughs> we documented each feature with architectural drawings, photographs, and GPS points, which allow us to create a geo-referenced map telling us precisely where they were located. When we combine the data from the surface survey with the legacy data, we get an incredibly full picture of what the sediment pattern over the past several thousand years looked like. As part of our work, we used photogrammetry to document both the fountain house and building A1. And so as not to confuse the photogrammetric software, we had to clear away all the bushes and trees that had grown over the past decades. An amazing team effort was born as our Greek colleagues of the archeological service and even local residents came out to help us. We stuck to our shears and hoes, which are a bit safer, and they brought the chainsaws and burned away the cleared brush. The results were stupendous and inspired some emotional moments among my Greek friends, one of whom had tears in her eyes as she saw the building emerging from the overgrowth. Our work accomplished several aims, as we were not only preparing the building for photogrammetry, but also preserving the buildings for the future and making them accessible for people in the present. I've raised the idea of bringing the area to life in an archeological park, something that would benefit the local population who are keen to share their special site with the world, but also academics, school groups, and interested tourists who would be able to walk in the steps of those ancient people who drew water from the fountain house or descended along that dark staircase to clean the cisterns were those who arrived at the sanctuary with a house model in their hands, hoping for Hera to grant them health and harmony in their own homes.
So what is history good for? As I was saying at the start, knowing the vast array of ways in which people have answered basic questions and how they have faced different challenges gives us choices here and now when we face our own questions and challenges. And every little bit of history contributes to this knowledge. All the pieces build on one another. So we cannot discount the history of one people and privilege another. It's the whole of human experience that is important. But there is something else I would say. For my Greek colleagues and friends, investigating the past is a way to take ownership of the history that matters to them and to tell the stories that they want to in the way that they want to. They exemplify one of the most essential lessons of all, that those who write history own that history, and thereby they're also able to shape the present. Think about it. People are creating history all the time. And doing history, having the skills to analyze the objects and the stories that are presented gives you the power to take ownership of the history that is being created right here in the present. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. That's wonderful. And those slides of yours don't make me wistful at all. But... Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Just bear with me while I uh, take down the slides. Next up, we have the delightful Gillian Smith, who um, is just coming towards the end of her PhD in ancient history here at Macquarie. And Gillian is one of the founders, co-founders and co-directors of the Studying the Past um, initiative. And Gillian will be talking to us today about engaging high school students in the study and value of history. Thank you so much, Gillian. Thank you so much, Tanya. I fell in love with Egypt in year three. We'd been studying ancient cultures and to finish off our study of Egypt, we made sheets of papyrus. Mine looked more like a lumpy wad of paper mache sprinkled with glitter. And we made cardboard heart scarab amulets. I painted mine hot pink. Many years later, after having worked on archeological excavations in Egypt, handled real artifacts and explored the Great Pyramids of Giza, the memory of nine-year-old Gillian making papyrus and creating her own scarab amulet is still firmly imprinted in my mind. Moreover, I can confidently say that without being exposed to tactile and engaging learning experiences such as these as a student, I wouldn't be completing my PhD in Egyptology today. Pedagogical studies consistently indicate that experiential and tactile forms of learning lead to greater student engagement and it facilitates increased rates of retention of key subject matter. This is one of the key guiding principles when designing and developing Studying the Past programs. Studying the Past is an education and outreach program established in early 2020 by myself, Alex Kuyunpa and Jacinta Carruthers. It aims to connect the discipline expertise of PhD candidates and early career researchers at Macquarie with teachers and students in schools in the Sydney school region. It was originally envisioned as an incursion program, so we go to visit the schools, but the program has adapted with 2020 and is now deliverable, deliverable both in person, COVID permitting, and through video conferencing like today. So far this year, we have engaged with over a thousand school students. Our reach extends across Australia with a significant engagement in rural and remote New South Wales. And we recently hosted our first program with an international school. It originated out of the Department of Ancient History, but the program has now grown to partner with Modern History and Macquarie's Department of Indigenous Studies. We are delighted to take this opportunity to announce that we are now taking bookings for stage five and six modern history programs for term four and for 2021. You can book those programs by getting in contact with us. 
while the programs are directly tailored to the New South Wales syllabus and provide students with an opportunity to engage in higher order thinking tasks like critical analysis and evaluation and synthesis of a range of sources, they are also designed to suit a variety of learning styles. They incorporate performance, creative thinking, visual processing, tactile learning and group work ensuring that the students are provided with an informative, enjoyable and enriching engagement with the historical events and personalities that they've been studying in class. In our program, students become archaeologists, detectives, museum curators, language experts and on the odd occasion, an apprentice in Barma or a Roman senator. An outcome of the program that the team is incredibly proud of has been our success in reaching rural and remote communities. We have worked with Macquarie's Widening Participation Unit and the Smith Family Organisation to deliver a number of online programs with schools in Broken Hill, Gilgandra and Interstate, who, due to location, are outside the scope of where Macquarie might usually reach. An additional goal of the program is to ensure that students are exposed to what a career in history might look like and why the study of history is a worthwhile pursuit. As we've already seen today, historians are incredibly diverse, not only in what they study, but how they study it and the influence that history has on their own lives. Our programs are facilitated by a team of dynamic and experienced educators who possess expertise spanning the historical record. They're actively involved in archaeological fieldwork projects and, most importantly, have a passion for education and humanities communication. What really sets studying the past apart is that our educators don't come from traditional teaching backgrounds, but rather are early career researchers working in academia, museums, archaeology, education which reflects the multitude of career pathways that the study of humanities offers. For a lot of students, a career in history or archeology span is unclear or maybe even abstract. I know it was for me, but to see what it's like for a day in the life of an archeologist or a researcher and to engage directly with them allows students to understand what the discipline of history offers outside a school environment. Most importantly though, our educationers are, pa education -ers are passionate about education and history and are enthusiastic about passing this along to students. So why is the studying the team, studying the past team so passionate about educating students on history? I'm sure we can all agree that the study of history is important as it enables an understanding of the world we live in, our values and beliefs. It encourages analytical thinking and communication skills. For young students, understanding their role in this world is complicated and daunting. The study of history allows the study of cultures, geographical identities and the development of society. And these are essential aspects in building a sense of community, self-belief in that community and fostering support networks for young people. A growing body of research confirms the benefits of building a sense of community. Students in schools with a strong sense of community are more likely to be academically motivated, to act ethically and altruistically, and to develop social and emotional competencies. Whether it's local Indigenous history or the history of the ancient Egyptians, history studies the human connection to place and to each other. Time and time again, it shows us the scope of humanity and the strength that lies in communities working towards a common goal. Our program encourages students to not only learn about the facts of history, but to forge a human connection with the societies of times gone past. Because it is through doing this that we can better connect, empathize and analyze our role in the world today. To learn more about our programs, you can follow us on Twitter at Past Studying, or you can email us at arts.historyprograms at mq.edu.au. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Thank you um, to all of our speakers. Um, uh, and even though you've heard from a range of historians who undertake research and teaching on many different national contexts and different time periods, there are some really interesting synergies between all of those papers and issues around community, around ethics and empathy are shared across them all. Um, we're going to take a short break, grab a break, so clearly I need a break, um, and uh, we'll reconvene at 10.20 and please be ready uh, with your questions. I can see that there are a few already in the Q&A um, section, so please feel free to ask away and hear back from our experts and share why you are so fascinated by history and uh, what value and significance you see in it. I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you very much.
Welcome back everyone. Can all of our speakers please turn on their videos but remain mute for the moment so we don't have chaos ensuing. Um, thank you again to all of our wonderful speakers uh, for their presentations. We've had some great feedback already on our Q&A um, function. Um, there's a question uh, from Cheryl Zato for Michelle Arrow to start off with. Uh, Michelle, um, and, and Cheryl wanted to say what a fascinating morning it's been, so thank you to all of you for your contributions. Michelle, at the end of your talk, you linked the way in which um, the government has continued to marginalise women um, to the way in which the government has handled the pandemic. Um, would you like to expand on that? How will historians of the future write about this year and women's marginalisation? Yeah, what's been interesting about watching this pandemic unfold is the ways that historians are almost immediately thinking about how it will be historicised. And there's been a lot of work from collecting institutions to collect a record of the pandemic. Um, and I think one of the things that you can see in relation to the ways the pandemic has impacted on people is it's there's a number of ways I think we can read it through a gendered lens. Um, there was a sort of notorious guy who was on Twitter in March sometime saying, if you don't come out of this pandemic and have learned a second language and um, have um, written another book, then, you know, you've failed. And all women just fell on him and went, well, we're looking after kids, we're doing all this extra caring work. You know, I think... For many women, they found that uh, it kind of was a, a bit of a, uh, a return to an earlier era of gendered divisions of labour. I think women found that they had much less time to work at home than they might have beforehand. And I think that's partly because we don't yet have an equal division of unpaid domestic labour. So women ended up doing more unpaid work. And also because more women are in part-time work, that was often the case that that work was the first to go in this kind of um, the mass unemployment that we've seen um, during the pandemic. We also saw um, in an academic, uh, from in the academic world that scholarly journals found that uh, numbers of papers submitted by women decreased during the pandemic. Um, and of course, we saw that the workers in the care industries that are most vulnerable, either to unemployment, to casualisation, or to actually catching COVID, are women, women in aged care, women who work in childcare. Um, a lot of the casual workers who were excluded from, from JobKeeper, particularly universities, were women. Um, childcare workers, again, a mainly female workforce, were the first to have JobKeeper removed. So I think that we can see that the ways that this government which doesn't have a lot of women working mothers with children sitting around the cabinet table, I think um, has really not thought about some of those impacts on women. Um, and I think probably historians, I mean, one of the great things about the proliferation of media about this is that, you know, historians will have a large and rich media record to look back on and, and kind of, I think, other kinds of records too of people talking about their own experiences of pandemic. But I, I certainly think that the lack of um, the kind of, family arrangements of most of the men who are making the decisions about these things um, has definitely influenced the ways that they have thought about women and the ways that women might need different kinds of supports in this moment. Yeah, and of course, we'll all be exhorted to have babies with this extra time at our disposal, so. Oh, look, so much time. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else have anything to add on that in this kind of moment? Just raise your hand if you do. Or no? Okay. There's another question from John Gorris, who has thanked you all for your presentations. Um, and he studied modern history at undergraduate level, uh, and since then he's moved into philosophy. Um, one of the things he found is that those people who don't have a sense for the variety of ways that humans have lived tend to essentialise their current societies. They end up with rather restricted views of human nature. A different emphasis on the value of history might say that historical events are analogous to modern ones or are essential to explaining them and can therefore guide us. He's wondering what the panel thinks the values of emphasising differences versus similarities between the past and the present are. That's a big question. Um, who would like to, to kick off with that? David, surely you do. You'll need to unmute yourself, David. You're mute, David. My apologies. Uh, of course, it goes without saying that, that um, history, like any attempt to understand other human beings, requires an attempt to understand the differences as well as the similarities. And I think that, that does go without saying. But let me give just one example quickly of, of, of the dangers of 
focusing on just particular eras of human history. And this is maybe seem an unconventional way of looking at it, but the vast majority of historical scholarship is on recent centuries. Um, if you look at the Journal of World History, you'll find it, 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 it seems to promise in its title uh, a commitment to the whole human history, which, which is, goes back 200,000 years. Um, but in fact, overwhelmingly, its stuff is on the last 500 years. Now, I think there's a huge danger in that. And the danger is that the last 500 years are a really weird era of human history. It is not representative of 200,000 years. If you look at indigenous origin stories, you get an account of human existence that's vastly more representative of most of human history. And it's not a story of um, dynamic conquest of planet Earth. That's the story of recent centuries. The story of, of in, most indigenous stories are telling a story of living with the Earth. It's a very, very different view of, um, of, 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 of our relationship to our surroundings. So it's a very diverse view and it's one that gets lost if we focus on the last 500 years. But I hope in, a, in an era of climate change it's obvious that the sense that we do not dominate the world. It's not a piece of putty that we're reshaping. It's something we have to live with. That is a message that has got lost in the last 500 years in the eras that most student, most historians study, and, and or even the last 2000 years. Um, it's got lost in that era, and we desperately need, need to recover it as we learn to live with the biosphere. Enough. <laughs> Thanks, David. Gil? Hi, as an ancient historian, I, I find this question fascinating because it comes up quite regularly um, in my Greek history. I teach, obviously, uh, Thucydides, who was one of the um, greatest of the ancient authors, and um, he's become he's come into relevance lately because of the so-called Thucydides trap that the uh, Athenians uh, and the Spartans went to war because the Spartans were fearful of Athens' rise to power, and that's being um, considered an analogy to the rise of China and America's fear of how this might how this might go, but it's always dangerous because you you look at at history and it, it's common to take a view that it's the um, that it's the sandpit if you like you can just go back in history and you can you can find examples and and Thucydides himself would have been delighted with that view because he wrote his um, history with the view that. Um, through seeing what had happened, this would be an exemplar for, for future events. But it proves very, very difficult to, to do that for the most part, that, um, that the past is a foreign country. It's a, it's a truism, but, it, but it's true. Um, so many things appear to be similar that we can look back and we can think, oh, yeah, that's analogous. We can, we can use that. But in reality, the way they thought is, um, is often quite, quite difficult. So superficially, it might appear to be the same. We can uh, attribute meaning to, to artefacts like um, Susan was talking about in her talk. But it can be very, very difficult to, to get an accurate understanding if you had an, an alien come and drop into the studio where I am at the moment and see this beautiful, um, brightly lit um, screen in front of me that probably presume that it was an altar to a deity or something. You, you just wouldn't know um, where, to, where to start looking at it. So I think um, there, are, there are different um, reasons that we might look at the, at the, at the past and um, different lessons that we can draw but we always have to be acutely aware of the, of the value systems that apply. And it's that understanding of those value systems that helps us to understand our own human condition. Thank you, Gil. Anyone else want to uh, respond to that one? Susan. Just to say, I totally agree with you, Gil. Like, sometimes it's good to see what other people thought, how they thought. And yes, I totally agree that sometimes the value systems of people in ancient times are not the same as ours. And that is useful to see for us and for students as well to think about almost to clarify what we do believe in and what we do value ourselves and to understand that it doesn't have to be that way, but we make it that way and we make that choice. And I think when you see something that's different it clarifies the fact that you are making a choice and that we are making a choice in our own society as to what we value. So that's, that's, a, that's something I think that is important to sort of really get your head around and 
think about and and is, it's a valuable thing for students and for us in general people in the world to sort of realize and then you can transfer that onto cultures today that are that have different value systems and uh, and you know you can see how they think and how we think and and at base like in a sense it removes our arrogance as well like yes in a way we make the choice to think this way but to see that other people have different value systems and different ways of thinking hopefully hopefully makes us less arrogant about our own and more understanding of how different people can think in different ways that's what i'm thinking thank you susan julian you're, you're nodding vigorously there so i think you should say something <laughs> I am. Um, I loved that, Susan. Thank you. Um, I love the phrase analytical empathy. And I didn't come up with that myself. That's a phrase that I've taken from somewhere else. But I always think about that. Basically, that sums up like kind of what you were saying, Susan, where what the, this great skill that history gives us is we need to, when we take away our biases, we have to be able to understand these choices that people have been making in the past. And whether we agree with them or not or whether they ended up with a positive or a negative outcome we have to be able to understand that so we need to be able to empathize with those choices but we have to do it analytically and that's what we have to do in the world today when we get a lot when we have to work with someone in the workplace that we don't agree with we have to be analytically empathizing with them um, and we have to do that cross-culturally and as the world becomes more interconnected and as you know events become more terrible in the world we have to get better at doing that to create a better society for us all to live in thank you julian um, we have a question uh from dr ian Tregenza, who is a colleague of ours in politics and international relations clearly we need to organize zoom webinars in order to have intellectual conversations with our colleagues but here we go he has a few related questions and thanks you all for your presentations does history have to be justified by reference to values or goods beyond itself as a seminar question seems to imply history what is it good for is it not possible to defend historical inquiry for its intrinsic value always a challenge but especially in these hyper utilitarian times who would like to have a go at answering that one claire thanks ian i, I wish i could see your face ian um <laughs> but it's a very very difficult question to answer but i guess my answer would be that um yeah hopefully the the value of applying the value of studying history, the values we apply to it, I would hope that they weren't utilitarian. But I do think that most of the time, invariably, when people engage with the past, in whatever context, nostalgically, professionally, politically, we usually do it with some sort of orientation. We, we, we come with values. Um, it might not be that there is an intrinsic value in as much as that's such a sort of a, that's, that's a question that implies such a sort of absolute um, understanding of what intrinsic means. And my intrinsic is probably different to your intrinsic. Um, so I don't think we can ever isolate historical um, study or historical consideration as something sort of pure and abstract. But I absolutely, but because I do think we all come at it with values, ideas. Um, what sort of orientations of what we're trying to get out of it or why we're attracted to it. But having said that, I also think it is incredibly important to fight for the value of doing it in a way that does not is not yoked to um, sort of crude utilitarian outcomes, because in the end, often we don't deliver them anyway. It's a, it's a promise that we can't satisfy. And what we do is actually um, much more meaningful when we take it outside of kind of metrical understandings of value. David? Unmute yourself. Mute. Unmute. <laughs> um, just very quickly, um, sort of on the other side of this, uh, any activity that's extensively funded by society and by governments has to justify the funding. Now, I love being a historian. So history is fun. I, ju I just love it. Um, but that itself, the fact that it's fun, I don't think is a good enough argument. Chess is fun. There are lots of things that are fun. Um, but, it, but we won't get taken seriously if we bid for government money, and a huge amount of government money is spent on history. So um, 
And I think we have to take that very, very seriously. We, 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 we are making as historians a claim on society's resources. And that claim has to be justified by something more than saying, yeah, well, this thing is inherently valuable. Um, you know, give us some money. <laughs> Anyone else want to respond to that question? No? So, if a 17-year-old asks you, history, what is it good for, what would you say to them in reply? And I hope all of you can answer that. Michelle? Well, this is a question that we often get at Open Day. You know, we get the students turning up and, and often the student is accompanied by a parent who is saying, they just love history, but I'm just worried that they won't get a job with it. And so I'm encouraging, you know, him to do a commerce degree or to do something else. And, and my answer to that, and it's a, it's a sincere answer, is that I think history is good for encouraging and stimulating intellectual curiosity. And if you have that and you can nurture that, then you will do well, you will learn, and you will not just learn about any of the things that we research about, but you'll kind of learn a whole set of skills that can then be applied somewhere else. So in some ways, I think, for the 17 year old who's passionate about history, I think the passion is the is good. And I think encouraging and nurturing that passion is really important. I mean, because that's where I was, I was a 17 year old who didn't really know what I wanted to do. But I really liked history. And I didn't have any plans to become a historian. But that's very fortunately what happened. So I do think that, you know, yes, we can make a whole lot of arguments about why it's important to learn history. But I do think that if a student has been um, has made that connection and feels that that history is something that wants, makes them want to keep learning, then that's the thing that's it's important for and good for. So, you know, keep doing it. Thank you, Michelle. Um, Gil and then Claire. Um, thank you. Um, I agree totally with Michelle. I, my mind went immediately to our recent um, online open day um, and the seminar presented that was exactly on that on that theme. And at the, at the risk of uh, venturing into utilitarianism, so you know that's just been panned a, a moment ago, I, I do think that, um, that the passion has to come first, um, that you have the, the lifelong interest, that we are human beings, we're on, we're on this planet, we have, to, we have to be able to engage, uh, we have to be able to enjoy, we have to be able to live our life. And for most people who are passionate about history, um, it is a passion that will drive them for their entire life, whether it be like David, um, uh, teaching and arriving at great eminence, or whether it be someone that just loves watching uh, a movie uh, uh, or a presentation on the History Channel or whatever, that doesn't doesn't matter. It's whatever drives them. But in the utilitarian sense, um, the study of history uh, is quite extraordinary because it's actually um, teaching people to see past uh, biases and prejudices. It's teaching it's teaching people to weigh evidence. I mean, one of the things that I like in my introductory Greek history uh, unit is that I, I say to people that I don't really much care in first year whether they remember names, dates, places, other than the, the really important ones, but I would like them to understand where evidence comes from. I would like them to understand that a fact, um, an historical fact is something that has, has happened, it's been significant, it's been recorded, it's come down to us. How do we, how do we understand the past? How do we know that? How do we weigh it up? Um, and above all, that we're engaged in the art of communication and that we have to be able to take that information, we have to be able to have done the evaluation and then communicate it effectively, be it in writing on, um, or by verbally or whatever. So these are the sorts of things that in a modern university like Macquarie, uh, these are the most amazing skills and they go into everything that you can do. Um, so it's not just whether you're planning on becoming a curator or going on to higher degree research. Um, it's going into business, it's going into government, it's going into sales. It, it doesn't matter what it is, it's all about communication. And, and these are skills that are more necessary than they ever were before. Once You don't go to a business now and expect to receive the gold watch decades later. You expect that you're going to be moving and you're mentally agile and you're able to cope with new information to understand it. So these are the sorts of things that a history training will, will give you. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Gil. Claire, before we move on to you, I just want to, um, Lucy Tax has come in with a comment rather than a question that I think is important for what we've been talking about. And she says she very much appreciates the comment from Ian about our utilitarian times and their impact on historical research and historical perspectives. And she says that we see this most profoundly in the low value given to historical research by business schools across Australia and, and presumably elsewhere in other national contexts. And she says that in these times, it is becoming more urgent for value to be accorded to labour, management, economic, business and organisational histories and historical perspectives on business in this kind of current climate. So, Claire, um, your response to that question. Um, I can speak to Lucy's comment if you'd like, because I, um, by by I, I think that she points, she's pointing out actually a really significant failure in the Australian Academy. Um, and I think, and, and it also goes back to a question that Karen Pack asked the, um, the chat um, earlier, that um, Karen is um, a theologian who's working on a historical PhD with Tanya. And she asked about um, the necessity to do historical work on people that we might not agree with, say, um, and not, I, I, don't, I'm not, I don't mean to use the royal we, for example, I mean, the I might not agree with, for example, people who um, have were vigorous opponents of uh, marriage equality or for, ex, you know, for example, social movements or positions that you might not share. And I think the Australian Academy, um, and I can, I feel like I'm partly in and partly out because I actually work on mainly on medieval Europe. The Australian Academy has really um, followed um, and, and, and I, I, you know, maybe Andrew Bolt's listening. I don't know if he is, but it has, it has been dominated by um, a, a somewhat Marxist historiography that has focused on cultural and social history and looked in particular at, um, at the labour side of labour history. Um, and it's, it's a tremendous cost because most of our lives, including those of us who work in universities, are governed by neoliberal logics around labour management. Um, we, live, we, live in a in this, we live in this world of late capitalism and, uh, uh, and we don't address it enough. As historians and we and partly it's because we don't have the competencies or we feel like we don't um, we don't know understand markets or feel like we don't understand markets and all of those sorts of questions but I think Lucy's actually pointed out a really crucial challenge to the historical profession at the moment and one that we haven't met well enough yet and it was great we had a history department seminar last week with um, one of our colleagues Matt Bailey has just written a book on the history of the shopping centre in Australia and when you think about the shopping centre, not the sexiest of topics in some ways, but actually the, the logic of the shopping centre governs our existence for many of us in much more greatly than, um, you know, um, a, another history of a certain type of art form or movie. You know, it's, it's just so profound, the shopping centre, and yet we don't talk about it because our historiographies and our training haven't led us to there. So I just want to say I totally agree with Lucy and um, we all need to get better at that. And we and that means being humble and learning some things we don't know about. Um, but in answer to the first question, I just wanted to briefly say that I used to give the worst ever answer to the open day question. And it used to be, history teaches you that everything you think is solid is not, and it's radically contingent and that makes us free. <laughs> but it didn't fly with the parents. Uh, um, so now what I say is that the challenge of our time is learning how to filter information, to make arguments, to work out what we need to know and to be coherent. We've never had so much information and that actually makes it so hard to be coherent. And if you study history, the whole world is an archive and the whole world is a big mess. How do you extract arguments and stories out of that? that that's the skill of our age. And that's what we can teach you to do as historians. Other disciplines do that too, of course. But um, as historians, we do that as well as kind of the ethical training about respecting the past, about um, situating ourselves and trying to manage ourselves as subjects who do have biases and all of those sorts of things. So I think history provides this technical training in filtering through huge amounts of data and making arguments, stories, reasonable representations but it also offers ethical training um, as well. So that's how I answer it now, even though I still believe the first one. <laughs> Thank you so much, Claire. Um, David? Just very briefly, and I think this is really a slightly different way of saying what, what has already been said several times. Um, 
history history is important partly because it's it's a battleground it's there there is very bad history and very dangerous history i i'm tutoring in a course on um europe in the 1930s um there's history that is simply gets it wrong that gets it wrong in biased and self-interested ways and one of the jobs i think of, of professional historians is not is not to say in a simplistic way this is the way it is but to fight against the worst forms of history because if they get out there and um are get 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 get, get a lot of publicity they can be very dangerous indeed so so i think you know keeping our understanding of the past honest um truthful uh is also one of the one of the key aspects of 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 of, of, of the dis history discipline and i think that's a different way of saying what really my colleagues have already been saying thank you david susan yeah just to add i mean again the same kind of thing but what i was saying in my talk too people who write the history own the history people who write the history and that's what people read and that's the story they hear if they take those things without analyzing them without being able to pick apart an argument and to say hold on you know maybe that's not quite right everybody has an agenda you know even if it's a good agenda it's good to know what the agenda is that's being worked on when people tell you certain things in ancient history modern history it's that's the skill that you get is being able to analyze being able to and Jillian talked about this as well you know being able to see an object see an advertisement you know read a text read a newspaper article listen to a speech all of these things are influencing us constantly and everybody has their own point to make and I think as a historian you can say ah you can step back a bit and say oh yeah this is some you can compare it to something that's happened before something that's happened 10 years ago 100 years ago a thousand years ago um, and that gives you that kind of like ability to suss out what's going on and i think that's something that people need to have in our society today and yeah i yeah i just think it's so important i always tell my students look at your source know your source know what your source is about and understand why the things are being said sometimes i'm not asking them to get the facts i'm not you know content is important i will say you can't do sophisticated thinking without having a sophisticated amount of content to work with that's something i believe very strongly which is why i think having full-on courses is important but when you have that content and you have that ability as gil was saying to weigh up the evidence you know, think, well, which one is more likely? You know, this is a skill that I feel very strongly that I'm trying to give my students all the time. And uh, yeah, I don't want to go into politics, so I won't, but uh, it's, it's very, it's crucial right now. And I will say on a practical level, I've had several friends of mine who I started out in graduate school with at, at different schools, American school, and uh, people who have come back to me because they've left the field and they've left the field and they come back and we have re gatherings or, and they say, oh my gosh, like we are now recruiting people from history programs, from classics programs, because those people know how to think. And that's important on the job, as I think the uh, uh, several people have said already, but I've seen it. I've seen people saying, you know, if you've got any really good students who want a job, send them to me. So that's that's a positive positive thing absolutely thank you susan and julian you must hear this question all the time when you're in high school classrooms and what do you say when you get asked that yeah we sure do but it's also a question that i was asking myself not that long ago i mean i, I like from a student perspective i kind of got to the end of my masters and i was like what am i doing like do i keep going down this path like what am i contributing um like am i going to get a job like what is this degree good for and i think that everyone's kind of summed that up really well that we do get all these really um 
and I, I think I have quite an idealistic view of what <laughs> history provides the world, but I do think it's, it's, it's this wonderful way of how we can connect with humans and our importance of understanding what role we play in the future of humanity, in the future of this world, and or what role we don't play in the future too. Um, but I think from a really practical perspective, you always get those lists of transferable skills um, for like jobs and things. And with history, it's this really cool discipline where you actually get to tick off every single one of those transferable skills. Um, sometimes you don't realize you're doing it really explicitly, but I honestly think if I was in charge of the world, everyone would have to do a history degree. Because <laughs> it gives you all these abilities um, to think critically, to th synthesize, to communicate in a whole different range of ways, um, which is so important. And, you know, I go to a lot of careers talks at the moment, trying to figure out what my next steps are. And again, like, as Susan said, there are ways like government wants you, like, you've got all the skills that we need, like, it's completely transferable. And one of the cool things about history, and I think this might be why it's so popular amongst um, young people, is that you have to know you don't just do history you've always got some other sort of specialization coming into play i mean i look at temple architecture so i read up a lot about architecture and things so then i like to think that i know a little bit of architecture so then that like little part of me that was like oh you wanted to be an engineer when you were a kid it's like well now i get to do a little bit of that or you know if you wanted to look at you know, science, you can bring science into history. So history is not this stagnant, like narrow pathway. It's so wide and everything we do can have a little bit of history brought into it. So what is it good for? It's what isn't it good for? What isn't history? Who isn't studying history? <laughs> Thank you so much, Julian. We're almost out of time, but I've got one more question from a teacher, and he's got a question from his history extension class. And this is a question that we get asked quite a bit when we talk to history extension students. What is the purpose of history, and is objective truth achievable for historians, and if so, how? Gil. Yes, this one comes up all the time, and I'd like to answer it that we are in a post rankian world. We no longer believe that um, absolute truth is achievable. Um, I like to think that we're in a post-postmodernism world as well, and that we've moved on from this, this idea, like on one side, it, it used to be thought that, that maybe if you just assembled all the facts together, that it would be perfectly possible to put them together and then right history. We now realise that that's not possible for all the reasons that have been discussed, the biases um, um, and so forth. Um, but it's also no good to turn around and say, well, we can't know the past, therefore we have to throw it all out. Um, so what we, what we need is some sort of um, uh, objective and some sort of lens on the, on the past. We need to know what we want to achieve out of it. Um, but to answer your question, you should go to Edward Carr, who, writes, uh, who wrote a, a beautiful and long-standing uh, book on uh, what is history, a collection of uh, essays that gives you all the historiography um, that would enable you to, to, to answer this question and takes it through the, uh, the thinking. But I think you also need to remember that um, each generation is um, obliged, um, condemned, you might say, to, to write its own history, and that will be from its own uh, perspective. And so what is objective? Well, of course, there's no such thing as objective. The, the best that we can aim for is to, is, as Susan was saying, to, uh, to, to understand it in, in our own terms and to know that this is not um, objective truth and that in 20 years' time, even 10 years' time, just look at Michelle writing a history of the 1970s. Uh, we're not too far away from it. Um, and I'm sure um, she'll be delighted if somebody comes along in another 20 years' time and looks at the... Um, at the history of uh, uh, feminism in Australia from a, from a different perspective. They'll have another lens that they will apply to it. Thank you. Yes, um, David? And David's about to, to start writing his book on the history of the future because he's taking a nice gentle path to retirement at the moment. I, I just wanted to make a very quick comment that I think that question about objectivity, I, I often find that uh, thinking about the way law courts work is a, is a good way of thinking about it. I agree with Gil completely. We, we never attain perfect truth. Our minds are small, the universe is big. But it's incredibly important to avoid crude untruths. And that we can do. And this is what law courts try to do. They don't always get it right. Um, innocent people do get convicted. 
uh, guilty people get freed. But the whole procedure of the law courts, and I think historians do the same thing, is designed to maximize the chances of avoiding crude errors. And in that way, we don't expect ever to get perfect objectivity, but we shoot for it. Thank you. And that's a good place for us to end. We should be shooting for objectivity and compassion and empathy and good ethics as well. Thank you to all of our wonderful speakers uh, for your presentations and for your questions and responses there. Thank you to our participants for your engagement and your really thought provoking questions. If there are any left unanswered, we will endeavour to answer them as I promised at the start after this. Um, and as you know, there is a recording available for you and that we will send it out after um, we have ended. I want to thank our faculty for their support and especially our Executive Dean, uh, Professor Martina Mullering. Um, thank you to Dominic Orth and her colleagues in events, uh, to our DAs, Kelly Drake and Betty Ha, and to the History Council of New South Wales for all of their hard work promoting history across the state. And we hope to continue communicating the value of history with you all for many years to come. Thank you very much for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone.